Be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to Dale Borglum's Healing at the Edge. We are very happy to share with you Dale's profound insight and open heart. Please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dale to support this podcast. I would like to explore with you today grief. We often think of grief as deep sadness in response to an immediate loss. But there are many kinds of grief, and very often day-to-day grief and unresolved chronic grief are becoming entangled with an immediate grief in a way that makes it very hard to process what it is that is blocking the heart. Unresolved grief tends to have a numbing effect, and these effects tend to accumulate and block free expression of the heart. So our goal is not really to stop grief, but to help process it, to help be with whatever it is that might arise in the heart. Please don't feel that there is one correct way to dealing with grief. Grief is very mysterious. I have obviously been with a lot of grieving people because of the work I do with the Living Dying Project. And I've had people say to me, the person I love most in the world died this last week and I don't feel anything what's wrong with me. And someone else comes to me and says, my spouse died seven years ago and I was walking down the street yesterday and I heard a piece of music. And I was in as deep grief as the moment that she died. What's wrong with me? Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with either person other than having a concept that grief should be a particular way. How alive are we willing to be? Is there a low-grade grief that separates us from each other, from ourselves, and from God? Unresolved grief tends to lead to addictive behavior, trying to avoid the pain, trying to fill the feeling of of emptiness. The pain becomes so familiar that we stop noticing it. All the unresolved trauma and loss of rejection, the, the cry to love ourselves, to feel compassion for our woundedness, for that which limits us. Grief limits their self-image and limits the ability for self-love. A brief poem here by Rumi. Don't run away from grief, O soul. Look for the remedy inside the pain. Because the rose came from the thorn and the ruby came from a stone. So, What we're doing here is beginning to distinguish between acute grief versus everyday loss. I know there are some people in the room who are in the midst of loss, of very uh, immediate and difficult loss. And there are many of us in the room who are not in that situation right now, but everybody in this room is grieving. There's acute grief and there's chronic grief. There are two kinds of chronic grief. One kind of chronic grief is unresolved, deep loss from long ago. And the other kind is the everyday grief arising from our early childhood conditioning, from unsatisfied desire, from the impermanent nature of life itself, from grief at the state of humanity and of the planet. And until we can resolve our grief, compassion will be very limited. We heard this week that eight people were murdered in Atlanta. 
there are racial and sexual and class overtones to that. Uh, Brian does live in Atlanta, but pretty much everybody else in the room doesn't live in Atlanta. When I heard that, I tried to feel what it must be like to be a family member of one of those people. I had some minor success in that, possibly. And my experience is that there's so much loss, just everyday loss going on in the world, that we, we tend to armor ourselves in a way that separates us from our actual true nature, that keeps us from meeting our brokenness because we're afraid we're going to be lost in it. Can we begin to turn toward our grief with open-heartedness? Can we bring love and mercy to those places that we have abandoned? The grief of helplessness is often the underlying emotion that leads to aggression and to anger. So opening to grief doesn't necessarily make it go away, but allows us to rest in it. We need to be able to trust our pain as well as trusting love. Can we trust our, our, our grief enough to explore it? For the longest time, I felt grief was only sadness, but grief is really any negative emotion that we're lost in because we're feeling separate. When we're angry, when we're frightened, when we're arrogant, those are very often expressions of our grief. We're feeling disconnected from ourselves. We're, we're feeling disconnected from each other. If we really felt connected to another person, could you be angry with them? Or if you felt connected with another person, yes, you could be angry with them, but you wouldn't get lost in the anger. You wouldn't hold on to the anger. It would come and go in a natural, appropriate way. It's not the anger. It's not the sadness that's the problem, but the either getting lost in it, becoming the emotion, I am angry, rather than anger is here, or on the other hand, pushing it away. Can we, can we be so trusting of our true nature that we allow these feelings of grief to arise as a healing message, not as a problem to be fixed, but as a message to open to? When I taught with Stephen Levine long, long ago, back in the late 1970s and, and into the 1980s, he talked a lot about soft belly. And what Stephen was saying, which I agree with, but I, I'm kind of taking it a step further than what, what he was saying, is that we tend to store a lot of our grief down in our gut. We, we, we create a tension down there that makes it very difficult to keep our heart open for more than a few moments at a time. So that the first thing to do is to be able to soften the belly, to go through the day and notice how the accumulated losses of just simply living in dualistic 21st century postmodern society creates grief again and again and again. And we tend to tighten against that. We tend to push it away. We're afraid of getting lost in it. So can we begin to, even right now, can you notice if your lower belly is soft or is it, is it, uh, is it hard like a rock? Is it possible as you breathe out, you let your lower belly soften? Opening to these feelings, once again, does not necessarily make the feelings go away, but allows us to rest in what's going on. First, we experience fear. We try to push that away from a very early age. But after we grow older, resistance often turns into guilt and shame. Can we begin to let go of armoring ourselves against those feelings, to begin to move into them, to begin to soften enough so that eventually we can have compassion for them? Right now, as we're talking, I'm guessing that for a lot of people, images are coming up, recollections are coming up, feelings of grief, memories of grief. Is it possible to let the belly be soft? Just as you breathe out, breathe down into the belly, 
let go of any resistance, feel exactly what's going on. Breathing spaciousness into the belly, creating a foundation for us to inhabit next the broken heart. Thomas Merton said, love and prayer are learned in the hour when prayer becomes impossible and the heart turns to stone. And in my experience, really this feeling of something being stone is, the stone is down in the belly. Uh, that first we have to soften the belly. Now you may remember that I've been talking a lot in the past about centering breath rather than soft belly. But centering breath takes it one step further, that as we breathe out, the lower belly becomes soft, but it also becomes strong. There's a strength. There's a sense of stability and, and fullness of chi. It's, it's empty of tension. It's soft, but it's also strong. Can you imagine that as you're breathing out, you're letting go of all tension, but you're maintaining strength down in the lower belly? And in certain traditions, this strong belly is exactly the foundation for beginning then to bear the infinite spaciousness of the open heart. The heart is really not a separate thing. It's a, a quality of mind. We could say that the heart is the depth of the mind. The mind is the surface of the heart. And to be able to plunge into the depth of the mind, which we call the heart, takes courage. It takes this sense that there is somebody who's able to bear the grief, that I'm not going to be overwhelmed by it. I'm not going to become completely lost. I don't need to push it away. So in the past, I've talked about a, a practice called the tantric three-step. And so far, we've talked about the first step of locating the sensations in your body, associating them with the state of mind that is, is grief. What does it feel like in your body? What is the feeling of the feelings? This hardness in the belly, other tensions in the body. Often in deep grief, in particular, we can barely feel anything at all. Can we, as a first step, begin to feel grief in the body rather than trying to understand it, rather than trying to associate it with a particular event. But what does this se separation actually feel like? What does it feel like to be separate from yourself? What does it feel like to be separate from God, from those you love? And then the second step is bringing the heart into relationship with what the belly has revealed. Can we then soften and breathe space into these areas? Can we cultivate heartfelt mercy and forgiveness? Can we love ourselves even though there is pain? So that when you remember the losses in your life, the big ones, the small ones, are they something that deny us entry into our heart? Or are they qualities that allow deeper access to places of our heart that we can't really find in another way? That in my experience, I've been in psychotherapy, I've been in body work, I've gone to long meditation retreats, I've taken psychedelic drugs. I've done all kinds of things. I've been with Maharaji and so many gurus. And in some way, being in deep grief, other than the direct experience of being with the guru, is the deepest access to my heart that I have ever experienced. When I can really bear those feelings, then my heart breaks and I can accept being with that. What is grief asking of you? Can we share our grief with another person rather than hide it? 
Okay, so the third step then, after we open our heart to the feelings, is can we understand the wisdom of the pain, making peace with it, ending the war with it? The deeper we can allow sorrow to enter into our being and be met, the vaster is the joy that we can radiate. Grief is scary, wild, untamed. So it, it isn't an easy task that's being presented to us. It's going to the core of the brokenness, being with those feelings, opening our hearts to them, and then even beyond that, finding a joyfulness because we're hearing the wisdom of what this message is. I think it's a mistake to too quickly forgive ourselves for what we're feeling, that very often we, we try to go into the heart and forgive and feel compassion before we have deeply enough explored what it is we're feeling as a way of sort of doing a spiritual bypass. Don't go there before you have a chance to feel and explore the pain. There is a possibility that you're not ready to forgive yet, that you have to feel longer, more deeply, what it is that's going on. Francis Weller, who wrote a book called The Wild Edge of Sorrow, a book I highly recommend about grief. Francis Weller, W-E-L-L-E-R, he lives here locally, has this great quote, he says, the work of the mature person is to carry grief in one hand and gratitude in the other and be stretched wide by them. And let me read a, a quote here, a poem from Hafiz. Don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut more deep. Let it ferment and season you as few human or even divine ingredients can. Something missing in my heart tonight has made my eyes so soft, my voice so tender, my need of God absolutely clear. So ordinary grief, this day-to-day -day pain just under the surface that leads to constant mind chatter, distraction, the intrinsic pain that is part of dualistic experience, we begin to accept that as the human condition, not something that can be open to, something that can be met with great clarity and great open-heartedness. There's a wonderful story about the rascally teacher, Gurdjieff, and he did a lot of very deep spiritual practice to the point where he said, that he had great powers. He was able to create on the physical plane what he wanted. If he wanted money, he just have to think about it in a certain way and money would come, for instance. He said, but even though I had such a powerful mind, I could not continue to remember myself. That was his term for staying awake. He couldn't stay awake. He kept getting distracted. He said, I tried saying a mantra with beads. I tried tying a string around my finger. I tried all kinds of practices. But whatever I tried, I would again and again forget. He said, but finally, I thought, what if I give up these powers and I have to feel pain in relationship to the world just like everybody else? Could the pain itself remind me? He said, and it worked. And it worked. Can the pain itself remind us? It's not my pain, it's the pain. Do, do we really need to become identified with it? Can we surrender our feelings of inadequacy, of shame, of guilt, at our imperfection? Can illness, loss, abandonment, dying reveal to us the sacred perfection at the heart of imperfection? One more poem, Mary Oliver this time. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. 
to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Let me read one more poem by John O'Donoghue called For Grief. When you lose someone you love, your life becomes strange. The ground beneath you becomes fragile. Your thoughts make your eyes unsure. And some dead echo drags your voice down where words have no confidence. Your heart has grown heavy with loss. And though this loss has wounded others too, no one knows what has been taken from you when the silence of absence deepens. Flickers of guilt kindle regret for all that was left unsaid or undone. There are days when you wake up happy again inside the fullness of life until the moment breaks and you are thrown back onto the black tide of loss. Days when you have your heart back, you are able to function well until the middle of work or encounter, suddenly with no warning, you are ambushed by grief. It becomes hard to trust yourself. All you can depend on now is that sorrow will remain faithful to itself. More than you, it knows its way and will find the right time to pull and pull the rope of grief until that coiled hill of tears has reduced to its last drop. Gradually, you will learn acquaintance with the invisible form of your departed. And when the work of grief is done, the wound of loss will heal, and you will have learned to wean your eyes from the gap, the gap in the air and be able to enter the hearth in your soul where your loved one has awaited your return all the time. Okay, I would like now to open up to conversation, discussion, remarks, questions and answers. Hi, Dale. Hi, and I wanna thank you for this talk. Um, and it's touching me to hear others and, and um, I want to ask a question. I have a, an ongoing, I guess you would call it a chronic grief, um, from the separation. It's been now seven years that I am no longer with my children's father and the boys go between us week to week. And it's like a, it's like an ongoing grief every week, um, for me and for them. And my question is um, something you said about not bypassing the depth of my own grief to come to a place of forgiveness or um, because there is guilt, there's, there's terrible guilt that's ongoing in knowing that I've contributed to or even created a kind of grief for my children and that I can't protect them from that. So the question is, is my feeling in my ongoing relationship to my grief what there is to do? Or are there other ways to help? my children with their grief. It feels like such a, an impossible dilemma. But I feel like what you're saying is in coming back to my own ability, like others are sharing to be with the grief, that that is the passageway for me to be with my boys as they grieve in their own ways. Yeah, I would agree with what you just said, that to the extent that you're doing this conscious grief work, that you're, you're creating some time, some sacred time 
occasionally, a protected time when maybe your boys aren't there, where you really invite the grief to come. Often it will, sometimes it won't. But you invite it to come and you do it as a ritual, as a practice. How how nakedly, directly can you be with those feelings? What does it actually feel like? Where is it in your body? What is it trying to tell you? And then can you open your heart? Can you become soft, spacious, hearted in relationship to these sensations and these feelings in your, in your body and in your mind? And then finally, accept the wisdom that might be there. I guess I would feel that from doing that, you would be able to guide your sons in a more uh, compassionate way through their own grief. Uh, I don't know how old they are. I don't know what kind of personalities they have. Certainly for them to begin to understand that grief is not an enemy. It's not a problem. It's a healing message. It's there asking you to investigate how to move forward from loss in a way that involves the heart. One wise person, I don't remember at all, who said, grief dares us to love again. And to the extent that you can really carry this grief on one hand and joy and gratitude on the other hand, that will allow you to love your sons more fully and wildly as sons need to be loved. At the same time, at a, in a much more theoretical sense, they chose a lifetime in which their parents got divorced. They needed to go through their lessons. And it's very difficult, admittedly, to see your children suffer, to see anyone you love suffer. But people... People suffering, my suffering, your suffering, everybody's suffering, is, is the result of resistance. It's the result of grasping. So it, even grief itself does not necessarily cause suffering. Conscious grief, the way I just described it, is a healing process. Getting lost in grief, pushing grief away, creates suffering. And for your boys to learn that there is loss in the world and we can have gratitude at the same time. We can have joy at the same time when people are being killed and, and how many babies are starving to death right at this very moment. How many, how many people are being raped or abused at this very moment? We have no idea, but the numbers are obviously considerable. So to be able to live in this world where all this stuff is going on and be able to keep an open heart really requires learning to deal with our own loss. Everybody is grieving. And to the extent you're feeling guilty, I caused this, maybe that's the first thing that has to, you have to work with those feelings and then you can forgive yourself. The more deeply you can do that, the more they will know that you love them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, in a way, we're talking about learning to love the dark goddess, to not only think that the good, the, the, the pure, the holy is light and happy and, and supportive, but everything that's arising is the, is the face of the divine, so that, that grief and loss is another face of God and a face that we can relate to rather than as something to run away from. Our society isn't, isn't very good at relating to the dark. We tend to get lost in it, run away from it, push it away. How much energy do each of us use trying to avoid or deny or push away the dark? Dale, I have a quick one that might not be so quick, but when you're talking about not blaming, I'm getting better at it, but it's easy to blame corporations and big injustice. I'd love to, how do you not blame entirely? How are you free of it? <laughs> A lot of meditation. 
uh, once again, how does one do this? The first and, and best answer, maybe, is that if you really pay attention and notice what it feels like to blame, you notice that your heart is closed. There's a sense of self-righteousness that temporarily feels good. I'm good, they're bad. But if you, if you really pay attention, there's a, a deadness in the heart. There's a, a lump in the belly. Uh, there's a disconnection from soul and it really in a way boils down to motivation uh how alive are you wanting to be how much are you willing to look at these difficult places that we've been assuming are the human condition how much do we assume that this background grief of being disconnected from quote bad people unquote is a uh, spiritual way to live. Really have been asking myself, who do I need to forgive before I die? Is there some person out there that if they showed up at my deathbed, my heart would clench? And I really can't think of anybody. I, I've had some very difficult people in my life. I won't mention them by name. So <laughs> some of them are people that are famous spiritual teachers who weren't exactly who they seemed to be when they were out on the stage necessarily. We won't go down that road at all. But what it really comes down to is that, to me, it feels like compassion for suffering, my suffering, the suffering of other people, is the center of, of practice. Any place where my heart closes, where I can't feel a spacious and a connected heart, because I think my mind is saying I'm right and they're wrong. That's the place that, that needs healing attention. The mind creates the abyss, the heart crosses the abyss. And any place where we're lost in our mind and thinking we're right and the world is messed up is limiting our ability to connect. That is, it's even blaming, blaming yourself, blaming political figures, blaming the environment blaming anything rather than uh, being with what's going on in your body, opening your heart, accepting the spacious, groundless nature of reality is a, a, a detour. It's a, it's a place where we're babying ourselves, where we're not willing to look at the pain that is inherent in that moment. Feel the quality of suffering that is arising when you're blaming, when you're not connected, and also investigate motivation. What is it you really want? If we have intention, if, if we create intention, I mean, when I wake up in the morning, I'm a very lazy devotee. I, I, I don't uh, chant the Hanuman Shalisa. I go out in the yard, I pick one flower, take it to my altar, I uh, light a piece of incense, and I've got about 20 different photographs and statues and things that I wave some incense around at. Uh, but then what I say is, I offer this day to you. Let me do this in the service of love and compassion. I Just that offering of the action. Like in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, do what you do, but offer the fruits of the action to God. It's really as simple as that, but as difficult as that. Jesus. It, basically, to me, there's a, a very strong relationship between grief and addiction. Mm. Very often, addiction is our attempt to get away from our grief, whether it's eating or drinking or sex or viewing or whatever it might be, rather than sitting with this emptiness, sit, sitting with this feeling of disconnection this feeling of blame, this feeling of inadequacy, so that it, to me, I really get that there are people who have acute grief. And I mean, in a way, it's almost a different practice than what I'm talking about, which is this day-to-day -day sense of separation that we get used to and that we, we uh, there's like a slight feeling of sadness, of depression that diminishes our joy. I mean, there's no reason why, I let me not say, 
There's no reason. But could we be joyful all the time? I think it's Wendell Berry who said, be joyful even though you have considered all of the facts, right? (laughs) So all of the facts are pretty dire in a certain way, we have to admit, right? Even with Biden as president falling down the stairs of the airplane every third day or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all is work that we all need to do. And just for me, looking at it as grief rather than meditation practice, looking at it as grief work was very useful. What I'd like to do is something I haven't done before is instead of me guiding a meditation, I'd like to read a, a meditation on grief that, that Stephen Levine uh, put together. I took it from one of his books with the permission of his his. Uh, wife Andrea after Stephen died or actually maybe actually Stephen told me I could do this it was way before he died it's a meditation on grief it's on our website what what Stephen has us do in the meditation is find a place in the center of your chest between your nipples and you take your two hands and you get your thumbs together and you find a place there that's kind of tender so that it's just a, a physical way of beginning to feel the pain in the heart. I'll modify it a bit. So begin, please, by invoking that which you love and trust. That which is beyond grasping, that which is beyond change, that which is beyond death. Receive the blessing the grace, the presence of pure consciousness. And as you receive this blessing, begin to feel your body breathing. And let your hand, let your thumb press into that point at the center of the chest between the nipples where it feels sensitive to the touch, as sensitive as you are. And push into this point. And feel what it is inside of you that's pushing back. Feel that place in you that's trying to resist, that denies the pain. All the armoring, all the resistance to life. Push into it. Let the pain into your heart. Breathe that pain into your heart. All those moments of self-hatred, all that anxiety, all those times you could just jump out of your skin. All those moments where you wished you were dead, all held there, all pushing against the pressure, all denying life. Let the heart break. Breathe the pain into the heart. Let the pain in. Let yourself in. Push into it. It's so long since you have entered fully into your heart. Feel the grief that lies there just beneath the tip of the thumb, all the loss, all the moments you couldn't protect yourself or the people you loved, the helplessness, the hopelessness. 
feel it, breathe that pain into your heart. Let go of the resistance. Let go of the self-protection. It is just too much suffering to be locked out of your heart. Nothing is worth it. Push resolutely into your heart, not causing you pain, but creating deep attention to whatever arises there. Breathe in that pain. Acknowledge that place which knows that all your children, all your friends will die someday. the place that knows that you might die and leave so much undone. All the things you didn't say, all the love you didn't give, all the pain you've held on to right there pushing back. Breathe through it, push into that pain, let it in, let it into your heart. Don't hold on, let it in. The 10,000 children starving to death at this very moment. The pain of mothers with empty breasts trying to feed starving children. The pain. All those feelings of having been misunderstood of having been unloved right there in the midst of these sensations. And how hard it is for us to love. How incredibly hard it is to keep the heart open. So frightened, so doubtful, so scared. Let the armoring melt into the center of your heart without force, without punishing yourself. Draw the pain in, draw it in with each breath. With each breath, let your heart be filled with yourself. So much has gone unexpressed. Layer upon layer covering the heart. Let the pain in. Make room for the pain. Breathe it in. Breathe it in. Let the pain come and let the pain go. Have mercy. Have mercy on yourself. Let the pain out. Breathe it in and breathe it out. So much held for so long. Let it go. Breathe it out. Let yourself into your heart. Make room in your heart for yourself. Have mercy on you.
Let it come and go. Let the thumb push into the arm ring that guards the feelings of loss and grief there. Focus the intention like a single point of light in the center of the pain. Go deeper. Don't try to protect the heart. Maintaining a steady, gentle pressure at the center of the chest. Feel the suffering held there. All the loss held. All the fears. The insecurity. The self-doubt. Surrender into the feelings. Let it all come through. Allow the pain into your heart. Allow the pain out of your heart. Each breath breathing awareness into the heart. Each exhalation releasing the pain of a lifetime. Let yourself experience it all. Nothing to add to it. Nothing to push away. Just see what is there, what we have carried for so very long. Feel the inevitable loss of everyone you love. The impotent anger of being tossed into a universe of such incredible suffering. The fear of the unknown. The ache of the loss of love, the isolation. Let go into the pain, breathe into it. Allow the long held grief to melt. Bring it into a soft awareness that dissolves the holding with each breath. Let yourself be fully born, even in the midst of the pain of it all. Let your heart open into this moment. Allow awareness to penetrate into the very center of your being. Use the sensations and the grief point as though they were a conduit, a tunnel into the center of your heart, into a universe of warmth and caring. Feel the heart expanding into space. The pain just floating there. Fear and loss suspended in compassionate mercy. Breathe into the center of the heart. Let go of it. Let the heart open past its longing and grief. Now take your hand away and fold it in your lap. Feel the sensitivity remaining, throbbing at the center of your chest as though it were a vent into your heart. Draw each breath into that warmth and love. Breathing in and out of the heart. Breathing gently into your heart. The spacious heart, the boundless heart. Heart vast as the sky. 
all thought, all concept arising and dissolving in this vastness. Realizing that you are the spaciousness, you are the emptiness as well as the content. Holding on to nothing, floating freely. beyond resistance, beyond hope. Dying with love into each moment. In this spaciousness, also inhabiting your body, your heart center, breathing in and out. Grounded and centered. Affection, balancing, attention. Nothing more whole than a broken heart. Trusting that brokenness Trusting that where you're broken there, God can enter in. Dedicating our practice with the wish that all those who suffer might be free of suffering. that all those lost in pain might find that space in the heart at the center of their pain. Shame off.